Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. I'm Sven Hosford, along with uh, Wicket, the podcast dog, who's uh, right here attending to uh, every word. Uh, today is November 4th, Election Day. Hopefully, uh, by the time you see this, you have voted. Uh, we have got our print issue out on the street. The fall issue is still out there. And in this podcast coming up, we have going to have an interview with Sana Karapalati. Karapalati, I think I'm pronouncing that right. She's a local hypnotherapist, and uh, she's known for dealing with many kinds of mind-body issues. We'll talk about uh, one of her favorite subjects in the art, uh, the subject of the article in uh, this issue, which is how to deal with the stress of surgery. Um, through many different mind-body techniques, particularly hypnotherapy. It's a fascinating subject. Really looking forward to that. And coming up in future podcasts, uh, next week we have Susan Silberstein. Uh, she is a PhD founder, president of the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. Uh, this is a organization, and on the website it says that uh, they believe 90% of all cancers can be eliminated through environment and lifestyle choices alone. And the science agrees. Unfortunately, most people don't know it. Can't wait for that. It's going to be a fascinating conversation next week uh, right here on this podcast. In two weeks, we'll have Judy Hollowell. She is a new energy medicine practitioner who's going to be joining the staff of Dr. Joy Sacconi's office up on the north side. So we'll look forward to that. Let's get into our calendar for the week. Uh, this is the week of Dr. Vonda Wright's Women's Health Conversation. Of course, by the time you see this, it'll probably be over. That's happening Thursday. Uh, coming up, a new thing next week uh, in honor of the veterans. Uh, last week, you remember, we had Dan Libby on. He was the president and founder of the Veterans Yoga Project. Well, the uh, there's a place over at Swickley called Clearly Pilates. And next week, all of their uh, classes, uh, which they ask you to, uh, to donate $20, all of the proceeds are going to go to the Veterans Yoga Project. Uh, really happy to hear that. That's clearly Pilates in, in uh, Sewickley. And you can go to clearlypilates.com for more information. And we really appreciate uh, them helping out the veterans. Other things happen for the veterans uh, that we've talked about here on this podcast. Uh, the, the yoga for veterans is happening on November 11th. Uh, we had uh, Jenna Lydie on uh, last week, I think it was, uh, talking about that as well. That's going to be at the cloakroom. Uh, Saturday, November 15th, mark your calendars, make sure you're going to be there. Juice Fest, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, that is going to be a lot of fun. We, Trenton has got all kinds of uh, fun events going to be happening, some speakers. Uh, we're also going to have our meeting of the uh, meetup group, our meetup.com integrative medicine professionals will all be there. That's coming up on Saturday of next week. And then on Sunday of next week, uh, Patricia Lemmer, our friend who's been on this podcast talking about her new book, Outsmarting Autism, is going to be doing the uh, Pittsburgh uh, book launch. Uh, that's November 16th at the uh, Schwartz Living Market on the south side. November 16th, 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, free parking behind the market on Bingham Street. That is it for the calendar this week. Coming up next, a conversation with Sana. Well, with 25 years of experience and over 10 certifications, Sana Karapalati is a MS, CHT is an highly experienced uh, and highly trained change therapist. And then she helps her clients resolve longstanding life issues and difficulties uh, due to stress primarily uh, such of anticipated events such as surgery or academic testing. She has developed her own psychological approach applying integrated energy methodology, which combines five therapeutic techniques, and that's hydrotherapy, or, I'm sorry, hypnotherapy redefined, guided imagery, Helen family constellation work, emotional freedom technique, and neuro-linguistic programming. And I promise you, we're going to talk about those without me garbling the names anymore. And uh, she guides her, her clients uh, into the subconscious, discovering the meaning of life and the challenges uh, and, the co and the coexisting solutions that exist uh, to their struggles. She has a great article in our current issue of the uh, Journal of Lifestyle Medicine on how to deal with the stress of surgery. 
And uh, that's out on the stands right now. And here to join us to talk about all of that and hopefully uh, fix any mispronunciations is uh, Sana Karapalati. Karapal Your name just has got too many vowels, let me just say, and too many consonants. Can we shorten this in any way? Car. I'm sorry? Sana Karp. Sonic carp. <laughs> I come from a long line of carps. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll refrain from any fish jokes. How are you doing today? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I just love your, your article. Uh, the whole topic, when you first talked to me about it, uh, everything about it is, is so fascinating to me. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I want you to, to first expand about anything you want to talk about related to this article, how, just how important it is that uh, we de-stressify ourselves, if I can use that word, uh, when it comes around this whole issue of surgery, preparation and afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, well, you have to imagine um, realizing whether it's voluntary or an, an elective, you know, like a, 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 a much needed surgery mm -hmm. that, it, you know, to hear you have somebody that's a stranger kind of entering into this inner sanctum where, um, you know, you've never been inside your body. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so there, there's a whole uh, shift in thinking that occurs when you get that, um, that, uh, for lack of a better word, the, the sentence or the need to have surgery uh, because you, there's a sense of loss of control or um, you know, no way to, to release or even talk through what one might be going through. And there's, it's, hard, it's difficult to predict outcome. Um, so all of this fear is then carried into uh, the surgery experience that actually can increase the probability of what we don't want to have happen, and that is, uh, you know, an extended hospital stay, complications, uh, you know, more meds, a lot of pain, and that sort of thing. So. When And it's interesting that one of the first things, especially the men that I work with, when they come in, one of the first things they say to me is, please don't tell my wife how scared I am. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think it's largely because they don't have any outlets and they, uh, they, they kind of becomes kind of a little bit frozen in that moment of, oh my, I need to have surgery. What I do is then, you know, um, you know, guide them to open, open that path in front of them, so they literally move through the surgery rather than being stuck in in it mm. with all of the negativity and difficulties that they're anticipating. Well, I think it's interesting. We we talk about it as the fight or flight syndrome, but it's actually the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome so well, it can be right? yeah do you find a lot of people that get they the, their reaction is more to freeze up like you say like the men that can't they don't even know who to talk to or, or people in general don't know who to even talk to to start processing this um sometimes when uh, when a client comes to me for surgery empowerment um i'm looking and I'm looking and listening because oftentimes it's not, it's not even their concerns, worries, or fears are not directly related to the actual surgery. Hmm. Okay. Um, it's about life. So I'm looking for what is it? Number one, how stressed are they generally, you know, the day before they received um, you know, the need to have this surgery. And honestly, um, most, well, at least the clients that I see, you know, they have an average stress level of say six, seven, 10. Okay. So, so then here comes an event such as surgery that is stressful in and of itself, no matter how minor. Okay. And there's no breathing room, you know, so 
their stress goes higher. So then all of a sudden, they kind of lose track in, uh, of, of possibility of the, the reality of, geez, I could empower myself. I could go through this experience strong. Hmm. That's a really interesting term you use, no breathing room, because I think that's probably literally and figuratively what happens is uh, they're, they're so stressed they literally can't breathe sometimes. Exactly. Right. And that is critical to healing. <laughs> Breathing's <that's>, rather important. <laughs> right. Right. And, you know, so, so if, you know, if they're carrying in these life stressors, now I'm not talking about everyday stress. I'm talking about what is it that, that gets unearthed as a result of the medical condition or the need to have surgery. And, ex and I'll give you a couple examples. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a, um, an invisible kind of hidden language that I look for. Okay, an example would be uh, uh, there are three people in the family who had the same surgery and one of them died. Okay, or um, my mother has the same condition. I need to have this surgery. Can I be uh, healed faster or be healthier than she is? Okay, so so often and sometimes it, it, there's there's a grief there, there's a grief issue again too that's not even related to the surgery. So a part of that is you know how do how do we you know, what do we do for a resolution here in terms of um, you know how do we clear that? And those are the techniques that I use because again it's not always directly related to the actual surgery. Because if you think about surgery, I mean, you have, you have, there's the risk factors of the surgery itself. There's what I carry in, in terms of my body health, my mental health, my stress levels, as well as, uh, you know, the skill level of the physician and, and all of that. So, you know, the more an individual become proactive in this movement through surgery, the, the more sense of control they have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've, you've mentioned that a couple of times, a sense of control and how important that is. So the, when you're working with somebody, you're actually giving them tools, not just in the session, but things that they can do afterwards and preparing and while they're not in front of you that they can actually do to help uh, regain some of that sense of control. Right, right. and that's, pretty customized to what is it that you feel like you need, okay? An example might be, um, well, one of the things that I always do, uh, and it's a technique that is so powerful in its simplicity, <clears throat> and, and that is that they never go alone. And what that means is um, I do, and I have this in the CD program that I sell for surgery empowerment. And it's basically that uh, I create this kind of inner image of uh, their family and their friends and their neighbors and their colleagues, the, their favorite barista, anybody that's kind of involved, the doctor, uh, anybody that's involved with the, in their lives or with the surgery. So we create this kind of powerful image where they're surrounded by all of this powerful love and caring and good wishes and strength so that when they go to the hospital, um, they are not alone. They are kind of being nourished by um, you know, all these people who, who love them. That's a, that's a great image to even have the barista there with you in yeah. the surgery. <laughs> I know mine would be there. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> you want good coffee when you get done. Right. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> so yeah. tell us, uh, let's, let's step back a little bit now. Tell us a little bit about um, a little bit about your background, how and where in your development as a professional with a, a, a great mastery of a lot of different uh, techniques and modalities, 
when did you first really become aware of the importance uh, of understanding stress and the role in stress in preventing uh, real healing? Where, where were you in your development? Where did that first really catch your attention? There were, there were a couple of moments. Um, okay, well, number one, I was working um, at, at a hospital as the primary therapist on the children's psychiatric unit. And I was literally sobbing in sessions with the teenagers. And I thought, you know, what is wrong here? I am a therapist. <laughs> okay. And so I, so after about a couple of weeks, I went to see a senior clinician and I said, you know, I'm not sure what's happening here, but I'm finding just this overwhelm of tears and sadness before, during, and after sessions with the teenagers. And he says, um, you know, any trauma in your life? And I'm like, no, I don't think so. It's like how powerful in that moment, I realized how powerful and protective the mind is. My mom had died suddenly when I was 13. My dad had post-traumatic stress my entire life, hmm. and he was he was near death at that time. So all of these kids were dealing with some sort of breakup of the family, abuse, divorce, neglect, abandonment, a sexual assault. So I was being triggered. I had no idea, hmm. and I didn't understand all that. This was in my 20s. Okay. And that was my foray, kind of that introduction truly to, to the subconscious mind and how powerful it is because I had never cried my mother's death for 12 years. Hmm. And those kids were instrumental in me taking a look at my own personal life and that if I was going to take on this responsibility of actually working with people that I needed to, I needed to work on myself. So, so that was a key point. And then later on, uh, another key point, because I was kind of after that, I was in and out of therapy a lot, trying to find some peace with this or integrate it somehow. And I don't know that I knew those words back then or the integration, but in the early nineties, I went and had this session uh, with this woman who does alchemy work. It was alchemical hypnotherapy. And she, in one session, I was able to finally work through, you know, my mom's death, or it was a beginning place. And so that I could integrate it in a way that I could also see that she had a life and I was in it with her. Hmm. So, the, and as soon as that happened, I said, I need to learn how to work like this. I said, this is who I am. And so the rest is in terms of me kind of developing myself using more energy psychology approaches that really talk about, like, you know, the energetic electrical system of the body and how can I process it through the subconscious mind. Yeah. I, the whole subject, I think, is so fascinating. And so we're still in the infancy uh, of understanding this whole uh, mind body unit theory which we'll talk about in a little bit but what other what other kinds of uh, situations or conditions do you help people with when they're that are that are really stressful that you found the kinds of things that you do are really helpful for what other life situations um well trauma um i love working with um the family the consciousness and I do that. It, it, the, my clients. Let me just back up a minute. All of my clients have. Uh, they're 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 struggling with some aspect of life. So it's they have a stress, anxiety, fear, worry, and, and they're not living um, freely. Okay. So what I do when they come to me is I I I employ these energy psychology approaches, uh, the hypnotherapy, 
EFT, which is emotional freedom technique, which is psychological acupressure, um, the Hellinger work, which talks about um, the soul consciousness that moves down through the family systems, and then guided imagery, and then anything else that I can create to be helpful. Um, so, so as I'm listening, I'm also listening for what's not being said. You know, what is the body? How is the body reading what is saying? What, what is the choice of language? Um, what is their facial expression? You know, how are they communicating to me? Because there's, there's a mind-body kind of, the, the, the body reads the mind and the bo- mind reads the body. And where can I enter into that conversation? Mm. Okay, because a lot of what's, because generally the presenting problem is not what's happening down here subconsciously. And this is where I work mm. with thought patterns, beliefs, um, imagery, uh, bod- bodily sensations. How, how is the person breathing? Okay, because all of that is, is an experience, is a packet in terms of that guides me to know where to go. Because hmm. okay, sometimes we think about the mind as just being thought and that it's immaterial, um, that it doesn't really have relevance. Well, you know, as you said earlier, uh, you know, the fact that thought or beliefs don't have an impact on the body. I mean, that's so outdated, yeah. dead, <laughs> basically, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, if you read the literature, um, I was fascinated. This, what the heck's his name? Um, Lair is his last name. He's a researcher. And one of the things that he said that blew me away um, was that when we have an aha moment and we have this this profound insights, you know, you could be in the shower, in the car, anywhere, uh, that they actually have found that, like, that there's a, an electrical movement in the brain before it reaches consciousness. Huh. <laughs> I mean, is that fascinating or what? Yeah. Now, is that true for all thought? I, I, I don't know, but we know, and, and we can't kind of separate ourselves from the power that thought has and the beliefs that kind of grow these thoughts um, on, on the body. Because we, you know, like, like me, I mean, your mind is private. I'll never know what goes on in there. Just like yeah. you don't know what goes on in here. Like what are my, the movies or the images that I hold, my thought patterns, but you can see it in my body. Yes. If you, if you know how to look. Yes. Yeah. I, I, a good friend of mine is a rolfer who has, uh, I've been with him walking through crowds and he'll point out people and say, oh, this pe- person's dealing with this issue or just look at the way they're walking there and they're going to have this problem when they're, you know, 20 years older. And mm-hmm. it's just fascinating how much, as you say, of our emotional presence and, uh, and um, awareness comes out through the way we hold ourselves in space, the way we carry right. ourselves, the way we move. Uh, and as you say, what we don't say. Um, right. I, I, I want to explore this whole idea about the, the mind-body unity. You, you actually have a whole bunch of tools in your toolbox, um, which have big, big, long, fancy names. Um, and some of them I'm very familiar <laughs> with. The, the neuro-linguistic programming, I love that. Um, a lot of people have heard, heard this term. Let's just dig in a, just a couple minutes on each one of these. Neuro-linguistic programming, you're actually listening for the way people talk or you're using, uh, this is the kind of where you've learned the skill of learning to listen for what they're not saying. Is that part of that technique? Well, at this point in my life and career, it's hard to separate out. Yeah. <laughs> but if you look at it this way, Okay, that hypnotherapy, the EFT, the Hellinger work, the neuro linguistic programming, all of the, within all of those modalities are strategies. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not just close your eyes and let me give you suggestions. Right. Okay, there are specific techniques that allow 
me to um, guide you through a process that um, change your mind, literally. I'll give you an example. Okay. And this is, uh, this is a um, one that's related to surgery. Okay. Since, you know, that's what we've been talking about. Um, a few years ago, I had an older gentleman who was actually 88 years old, who was going in for uh, cancer surgery. Uh, this was like in 07. And he had a nodule on the inside, on the outside of the lung, in the inside of the chest cavity. Okay, mm -hmm. and when he came in, he was an emotional wreck. The doctor said to him, "You have less than ten percent chance of surviving this surgery, oh. and if you survive, the treatment will be excruciatingly painful." Okay, so um, so I'm thinking, okay, what do I do here? Where do I go? So I, uh, so I, in, in him, hey, how are you, like, tell me more. How are you thinking about this? Let's go back to that moment when you got that information from the doctor. So what happened was it was really interesting. And this is how I kind of start kind of neutralizing and pushing away clutter, emotional, mental clutter, so that I can begin to build and expand on the individual's power, their resources, their affirming life. So the surgery. So he had an image that he couldn't get rid of of the physician's face when he said that to him. Hmm. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, uh, after two sessions, he decided to change uh, the surgeons because of the bedside manner. So he had this, this, this frozen image in his mind of whatever it was that was horrifying of the doctor in that moment telling him this. So he, again, uh, you know, it, it was stuck there in his, in his brain. So using neuro-linguistic programming techniques, I knew how to get that out of his brain in a matter of five minutes or less. Okay, so that he was uh, uh, able to breathe and we could move forward in, uh, in doing whatever it is he needed to do. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, interestingly enough, uh, just if I can give you a couple of sentences about this situation sure. with this man, um, I, I decided to start with a basic premise that you are alive. Okay, you are a living, breathing being. And so I started looking for resources within him. When was he the strongest in his life? Um, you know, his fate and how long he lives on this planet is between him and God, mm -hmm. barring any accidents. OK, uh, so as we expanded that and he we, I had two sessions with him. I made him a customized CD and he went through the surgery and he survived. Mm -hmm. Actually, the doctors were surprised. <laughs> so then he's in his treatments and. The doctors and the nurses kept coming, aren't you in pain? Doesn't that hurt? But I, I showed him how to go there strong, mm -hmm. how to mentally practice, how to use his breath, how to use imagery, how to change his experience so that he could move through the whole experience in power. So finally, can I, you have to keep in mind, this man was a very proud, he was a, a college professor. Mm -hmm. And he finally turned to them because they kept saying, aren't you in pain? And he finally said, please shut up. Let me do my work here. <laughs> Good for him. I was, it was like, bravo. Good for you. You know, so he ended up living, you know, because the, the cancer, you know, he ended up living about seven or eight months after that. Yeah. But, you know, in his mind, what he realized was like, no one is going to tell me when I'm going to die and yeah. it's not going to be on that table. So when he went into surgery, he was ready. He surrendered himself 
and he did everything I told him to do. Because, you know, when you go into a surgery, you have to stay down in these deeper states of mind here, you know, after, because that's where the healing is. Yeah. You know, and there's lots of ways to do that using EFT, using imagery, using CDs, using music, prayer, um, you know, anything like that. Yeah. You really do have a, a, a pretty remarkable uh, box of tools. Uh, that's the metaphor I like to use because in the Navy uh, that I was trained in, we, we learned that uh, to use every tool in the toolbox because if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And right. it seems like you've pretty well solved that by you know having quite a large variety of tools. The one I really like to talk about, and we haven't had anybody on the podcast yet do uh, talk about this very much, is the the Hellinger work, the family constellation. This is so fascinating uh, for anybody who's ever studied energy work at all. Um, we all understand, and I've I've been through the work. I've, I've worked with uh, Mark Wolin, mm -hmm. and. Um, Anyone, you, anyone who's ever been through the work, you understand that we have our own personal energy field, and then what what uh, old old Doctor Hellinger described uh, discovered was that our family, our whole ancestry, has a unified energy field that transcends time and space. You know, and this is where we get a little bit weird and metaphorical and metaphysical and things, but. You know, there was so much power in discovering some things about my ancestors that I never knew. And within months after I had the session with them, I found myself standing on my great-grandfather and great-great-grandfather's grave in Florida, which I'd never known I even had. Uh, and so much healing came out of this. It's, it's a whole story unto itself. But tell us your your work with the Hellinger work with the family constellation, how does that impact this whole conversation that we've been having about stress and, you know, uh, all that it impacts in our life? The whole issues with family, it can be so healing or if not addressed mindfully can be so much of the problem. Is that not true? Right. Um, the, the way, the way I, see it okay there there's a there's a family consciousness that every family has and you're right to say that within the family we are unique individuals but there's this collective consciousness the family mind the family subconscious mind so to speak that moves down through the system okay and that includes uh philosophies and practices uh, you know, money issues. Uh, we look at trauma. What are the events in the family that change the course of the family? Uh, who's excluded is is huge. Uh, an exclusion might be someone who was criminal or a jerk or handicapped and institutionalized. Somebody who died young and tragically. So when uh, so when we're born into a family, okay, and we have mom and dad, okay, their, uh, their ability to be present and how they love us is kind of set from what has happened behind them and also in their lives. So, so it, I refer to it as like a bleed, okay, or where there's a calling for resolution of these issues. So we're born into the family. So in part, okay, we're fated to carry burdens or to attempt to resolve issues in a way through, you know, our childlike illusion that we can create those changes. You know, so then we grow up and we realize that something's not working. I, I'm not living to my potential. I'm unhappy. I'm depressed like mom. Okay. Or I'm noticing this pattern and I'm just like my dad and uncle. You know, so, so the idea is with the Hellinger work is to acknowledge what is and what is true. Okay. And what is it what are the beliefs that you kind of have held within yourself in terms of um like 
what is the energy that you're carrying for the family? Because oftentimes children will carry these burdens, um, you know, that really belong to ancestors. Yeah. Okay. You know, a really good example of that I'll just use myself is, um, my dad was in World War II, and when he was um, like in his early 20s, he had a serious face wound. He was shot and, you know, ended up three years in the hospital where they had to reconstruct his face and everything. Mm. So uh, uh, the same age, I have a car accident mm. where I hit the steering wheel, knocked out. A couple bottom teeth, had some stitches, and also cut my tongue. So it was kind of like that same area of the face. I mean, and I remember clearly to this day when I, when he came home from work and I was laying on the couch and I was all swollen, he couldn't even look at me mm -hmm. because I know that I triggered him of you know what happened you know to him and the trauma that he carried his whole life. You know, so oftentimes. Uh, you know, so so going back to surgery stuff, you know, like illnesses and uh, those kinds of patterns also move down through the system. Like yeah. sometimes children will become ill because mom and dad are fighting. Right. Okay. And they take they take the attention away from the marriage and put it on them, and they sacrifice yeah. their lives yeah. Yeah. or their health. Um, so. It, and the, the fascinating thing about it, uh, Sven, is that you can heal things so quickly. Yeah. And there's a pulse that happens that I, I never have any idea. I would never dare to say what's going to happen in your life after we do this work because it, it expands and it breathes in a way that freeze the individual as well as can change the family yeah yeah and the effect is on the whole family that's what's really fascinating the family behind us as well as in front of us mm. yeah yeah i mean it's um i actually created a technique called the family table hmm. um where and this is for people that have eating struggles uh, because there's a whole rhythm and energy with eating so you can actually put yourself at the table. Where did you sit? Who sat where? You know, how was food used? Who was drunk? What was the philosophies that came to the table about life, about food, about eating? You know, who died? Who came to the table? Who left? You know, and you can see the whole dynamic played out uh, and we actually sit around tables in my house in where I, because my home office, I, I work out of my home. Sure. And we do these processing where they say, oh, my gosh. And I'm still eating in competition with my brothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we can shift it very quickly uh, so that they can return to them, to return to self, yeah. really, and then redesign or reset what it is they want to do how they want to eat that's always been the most fascinating thing to me is that with that with the family constellation work is once you understand that you're under the influence of this energy and how it's influencing you, it's so much easier to fix it remove yourself from it change it you know respond to it but unless you understand that you're this this is that you're in this energy flow or the that you're under the influence of this family constellation you can't even begin to address it that's that's what's so amazing so it's almost like it almost becomes like a silver bullet in a way um mm -hmm. would you say i mean some of these techniques i you know like the eft people talk about instant cures two or three treatment cures you've mentioned a couple times you've had very quick uh, cures some of these things really are silver bullets in certain circumstances would you say Right. I, I I mean you don't want to promise that anytime, but I can't promise that because yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean I just do the work. Um and using these techniques uh just give me a lot of tools, what you said earlier. Yeah. And I made that decision years ago. Again, <laughs> you know, I 
I, it was like, how do I manage life? What do I do with this racing mind? You know, when I think this way, what does that mean? You know, and I, so I started asking all of these questions. If, if this negativity is hurting my body, can I change it? And can being more positive or affirming or not emotionally charged create change in my body? Yeah. You know, so, you know, so having tools in, in, in realizing when do I start veering off and how do I return to what is my, my, my normal, you know, my balance mm -hmm. uh, it is really key uh, it, in life whether you're going to surgery, whether you're ill, whether you have pain, whether you want to play a good game of football, you know, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Well, this whole, the whole subject, I mean, I, we, we've got a good 30 minutes now. It, this whole subject is so fascinating. And as I said, it's this understanding now that it, science is actually starting to talk about the, the mind-body unity theory. Have you had any direct uh, exposure to this from any uh, any training you've had recently? In, in that, well, that's I live and breathe <laughs> work. <laughs> I am I, I I trained with Jean Achterberg. Did you do you know her? Uh -huh. uh, she she was one of the she wrote uh, imagery and healing. Oh, okay, okay. One of the classic books. Sure, uh, it's amazing. Uh, one of the first people to study, um, you know, the mind-body connection, uh, and Candace Kurt. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Bruce Lipton, you know, all that. So I read those books and study a lot. Uh, and if you look at what stress does in the body, and I think, again, we're largely disconnected from the impact. We just think I'm pacing, I can't sleep. But what's happening in the body is very critical to health and well-being yeah. and longevity. Uh, you know, how you're living in your body is, you have to ask yourself the question, is what I'm doing now depleting me, aging me, mm -hmm. or am I anti-aging myself? Because yeah. when we live with chronic stress, and that the body has a, a, a mechanism that allows us to be stressed, but then we need to move on. Okay, but right. um, are you familiar with Robert Sapolsky? Vaguely, yeah. He studies stress, and he came up with this term that I thought was really interesting. Um, ad, advent, um, anyway, what he said was, when we stress, have pain and suffering, is that we we make these decisions on, you know, how we'll stress, what it could be for us, what it was in the past, and who else felt this way, and you know, how will we be with it? You know, so we make all of these kind of quick decisions about how we hold life, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's surgery, whether it's work, whether it's whatever. But inside the body, if we're choosing stress, um, you know, if you think about what happens in the stress mode is that blood flows to the muscles. So the digestion really slows down and all of the vital systems um, start to uh, quiet or I, I don't want to say stop because, you know, that's not true. I don't know what the right term would be, but mm -hmm. but you don't need to, um, you know, your liver doesn't need to regenerate when you're stressed right. or right. you don't need to produce eggs, you know, uh, or digest food. So if you're living in a chronic stress environment internally, uh, you know, the body is degenerating. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you can't separate the body reads the mind, the mind reads the body, and, you know, you have to find a way, how, to, how am I going to enter into this conversation and own what's happening, yeah. you know, so I can make the changes? Well, it's a fascinating subject, and uh, we could go on at least another hour because I have that many more questions. But uh, <laughs> I want to uh, honor both of our times here. Is there anything yes. important about this whole subject that you think uh, we should cover that we didn't cover yet? 
Well, I, I, you know, I think there's a lot of factors that influence our lives and that um, I think, well, since I work from a mind perspective, I think as adults, it's really important for us to review our thinking, mm -hmm. the images that we hold, the language we use, the, um, the movies and the fantasies that we have, because all of that is communicating to our bodies and our bodies are neutral, so they're responding to it. So I think it's a really good idea to do that periodically, just like you clean out your closets. You know, does this thought work for me? Does this belief still work for me? You know, is it from my family? Is it from the culture? Do I, is it something that affirms my life mm -hmm. and defines who I am now as a, as a person, as a woman? as a professional, whatever it is. So yeah. Mindfulness. It's the word of the, the word of the decade. I think it's where medicine truly is going. So, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Being aware. Attentive. Senna, it's been great fun uh, having this conversation with you today. Thank you so much for being with us. You're quite welcome. And that will do it for today. Uh, That's another edition of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. Great guest today. I really, uh, this, this subject I just find so fascinating. Join us again uh, next week. Every week uh, we record a Tuesday at 4 o'clock. We post them on Wednesday. We put them up there on uh, uh, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, Stitcher, and now iHeartRadio. So if, uh, Wicket, uh, Wicket, uh, Wicket the uh, podcast dog, and I both say until next week, you just be careful out there. <laughs>